hi everybody. I know everybody knows Bob McKenzie. Did you know he graduated from UC Berkeley as a math in math? He and he was just telling me about UC Berkeley back in his days. He was a math teacher for 37 years, I believe, in Redondo Beach. He's also an avid sailor and racer. He likes to read. He loves trains, flying, ham radio, and to travel. He's been a docent since he was in class 85, 45. That's about eight years. And he mentors docents. So Bob's going to talk now on the exploration of California. Welcome, Bob. Thank you. Can everybody see the screen, the first screen on there? Because I'm going to be using that. OK. So uh, this whole thing started many, many years ago when I saw this chart in Redondo Beach Library. I want Everybody knows that the first uh, settlement in California was uh, San Diego in 1769. And this is tracks of Spanish ships in the first half of the 1500s. <clears throat> you can see there's a lot of expeditions. This isn't all of them. And so I was thinking, well, wait a minute. That was 200 years before San Diego, actually 250 years in some cases. <clears throat> Why wasn't San Diego settled before that if they were crawling all over here? So I did some research and I found out that not only were the Spanish all over the Pacific Ocean, they were all over the Indian Ocean, all over the Mediterranean. The Portuguese were all over the Indian Ocean. <coughs> oh, brother. And the only two places that they hadn't explored and settled were California and Australia. And this was crazy. This didn't make any sense at all. <coughs> I'm sorry. So I boiled it down to two technical reasons and three political reasons is why the, the California took another 200 years to be settled. So the first one is technology. So this is called a carvel. It's a precursor of a Spanish galleon. They were very seaworthy ships and very fast in relative. We're talking the Middle Ages here now. Um, and they were very good sailing ships, not too good for cargo, but for exploration, they were, they were fantastic. They only had one drawback. And that one drawback was they could not sail into the wind. So in the carvel, you could sail downwind. So if the wind was coming from the north, you could sail south. You could also sail east and west across the wind, but nowhere north was possible to sail in these ships. Uh, and, and even nowadays with my modern racing boat, we can only sail a little bit into the wind, maybe halfway, but we can't sail straight into the wind. So the, these were the racehorses of the day, the, the Ferraris. This was the, the top of the line. So this is what Columbus and the Portuguese had to work with. The other major thing is that we look at the uh, we world weather and current patterns. And I'm going to be doing something on weather and explaining why this all happens. But every major ocean has what's called a gyre, G-Y-R-E. And you can see here in the North Pacific that there's a circular pattern. It's always clockwise in the Northern Hemisphere. And the wind and the currents always do follow this pattern right here. It's always clockwise. Notice the North Atlantic also has one of these gyres, clockwise. And the Arctic Ocean has one called the Beaufort gyre. gyre. And that's related to the uh, polar vortex and everything, which as you've been hearing about on the news uh, up here. South of the equator, the gyres go the opposite direction. So the South Pacific gyre goes counterclockwise. And the Indian Ocean gyre goes counterclockwise, and the South Atlantic Ocean gyre goes counterclockwise. So I want to point out a couple of things. First of all, every one of these gyres has what the sailors call a hole. In other words, there's an area where there's basically no wind. And if you go into the hole, like the sailboats check in, but they don't check out. Uh, the center of this hole is this famous North Pacific garbage patch. I, I've actually been there, and it's, it's awesome. The North Atlantic one is, the, maybe you've heard of the Sargasso Sea. But in all cases, if you're in a sailboat, you want to avoid these, what we call holes. Second thing I want you to notice is that the current and weather patterns go down the coast of California. So everybody, can, everybody, can everybody see the cursor that I'm using there? Um, so if you wanted to go to California from Japan, you would want to sail north on the gyre. If you wanted to go from California to Japan, you would sail south on the gyre. 
Okay, same thing happens with the coast of Africa. This is going to come up right away. Notice that the gyre is running the opposite direction. So if you're trying to sail down this coast of Africa, you can't do it in a car boat. It's not, it's not possible. At least it's very, very difficult. This comes up almost right away. As a matter of fact, we're going to do it right now. Okay. So now you have the technology of the Carvo and you have the patterns of the weather. This is the world in 1492 when Columbus was sailing. And you notice Europe is here. Here's Africa, of course, but Asia is totally controlled by the Arabs. Remember, this was the days of the Crusades. So the Arabs and the Christians were not getting along real well right now. <coughs> the big deal here was this is the Silk Road and the Arabs controlled it from China and also the Spice Islands. Now the big deal in 1400s was the Spice Islands. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm not used to talking anymore. <coughs> um, the spices like cloves were worth more than gold. A pound of cloves was worth more than a pound of gold in those days. So this area right here was extremely valuable and the Arabs controlled it. So if you wanted spices, you had to buy it from the Arabs and they were charging a lot, believe me. Okay, the big breakthrough came right before 1500. It's 1488, a man named Bernal Diaz was sailing down the coast of Africa. Now to put this in perspective, the Portuguese had been sailing down this coast for 50 years. And after 50 years of sailing, they got about two thirds of the way down. Now this was very valuable. They had ivory, gold, and slaves, unfortunately. And so this was very lucrative. Wow. And so Bernal Diaz got about two thirds of the way down and he was blown off course. And he was blown across the ocean and south. And they figured they were doomed. But all of a sudden he picked up the bottom of the gyre here and followed it to the Cape of Good Hope, the tip of Africa. And this was just a stroke of pure luck. Shouldn't have happened, but it did. And now, Diaz realized that he could sail to India. His crew mutinied, it wouldn't let him, forced him to sail back. But when he got back to Portugal, they realized that now they could have a sea route following the gyres to the Spice Islands. So the race to the Spice Islands was on. This was a big deal. And this started 30 years of maybe the most fantastic 31 years in the history of the world. And so we're gonna be covering a lot of that, but amazing things happened in that period. Remember, this is the Middle Ages. so. 30 years is nothing but a speed bump, but it really changed the entire history of the world. And so we're gonna start with this history. And the first player on the stage is a man named Christopher Columbus. You've, everybody's heard of him, I'm sure. What you don't realize is that he was sailing for 20 years under the flag of Portugal. He became a Portuguese citizen, married a Portuguese princess, and spent the, most of his career sailing up and down the coast of Africa for the Portuguese. He also knew the world was round. The whole concept of the people thinking the world was flat was not true. Um, every intellectual knew the earth was round. Even the Greeks knew it 2000 years before. Uh, the churches didn't want to admit it because they wanted to keep the earth as the center of the universe, but all, everybody knew the earth was round. So Columbus wasn't worried about sailing off the edge. His plan was to start from Spain pick up the Atlantic gyre, which he'd sailed many, many times down the coast of Africa to the Canary Islands. Now the Canary Islands are a possession of Spain. They've been a possession of Spain for many, many years. Uh, actually, they're actually a state of Spain, just like Hawaii is a state of the United States. And Anna's, my, my wife's uh, sister lives on the Canary Islands. But instead of sailing south to Africa, he sailed west. Now, how did he get permission to do this? Well, the story is a little different than what you've heard. Once Diaz got to the tip of Africa, Columbus realized what was going on. And he'd been bugging the uh, king of Portugal for years to let him sail west and they wouldn't let him. So he went to Spain and he said, listen, if you guys are gonna miss the boat, if the Portuguese get to the Indies first, you're screwed. So I wanna let me sail west. I think I can get to the Indies sailing west and we'll beat the Portuguese. So he did sail west following the gyre and got to the what he thought was India. So at this point, the Spanish are in India, as far as everybody knows. Uh, the genius of, of Columbus was that instead of sailing 
northeast back to Spain, which we would have been in the hole, he was smart enough to realize that he would sail northwest, which is the opposite direction. Then he picked up the gyre and then he sailed around to Spain. This was Columbus's genius. Um, one little aside here before we go on is that after this, the next 30 years, there was armadas of Spanish ships, as many as 30 ships at a time were sailing to the New World. Columbus in the next uh, 10 years made three more voyages to the New World. And all of the Spanish ships carried cargo, but for every pound of cargo, they had a pound of contraband with them. And this is going to become important later on. So where did they put it? Well, at night, they would throw the cannonballs overboard, which were at the bottom of the ship, and put contraband in and then cover it up with cargo. So now the ships were sailing back on this gyre with no ballast. And so this is why most of the Spanish ships were wrecked off of Florida, because they would get caught in a storm and they were, instead of being extremely seaworthy, were very unseaworthy now. And so it was very, very scary to be on one of those ships in a storm because it's just like a sailboat with no keel. But th so this, this comes back into the story a little bit later on. So this is the story of Columbus's voyage. And what happened was when Columbus got back to Spain, the Portuguese were horrified. They said, whoa, the Spanish are already in India. What are we going to do? So they went to the Pope. And they met in a city called Tordesillas, which is north of Madrid. Turns out the Pope was Spanish in those days. And there was a huge row. The Portuguese said, we own Africa. What are you doing? You can't do this. So the Pope said, listen, this is, boys, this is the way we're going to do it. I'm going to take a line, and I'm going to draw a line right down the center of the Atlantic Ocean, all right? And everything east of that line is going to be Portuguese. And that includes Africa. And everything west of the line is Spanish. And of course, they thought this was Asia at the time. They thought this was the Spice Islands. Um, the Pope made two mistakes. One of them was not intentional, but you see this line coming down here? This is the line that separates the Spanish and Portuguese territories. Notice it cuts Brazil. Of course, nobody knew South America even existed at this time. What language do they speak in Brazil? Portuguese, right? So now you know why in Brazil they speak Portuguese. This is a better picture of that same line uh, it turns out the Portuguese thought the world was bigger and the Spanish thought the world was smaller. So you can see that the Portuguese line is quite a bit to the left of the Atlantic Ocean Center and it cuts off a lot of Brazil, which wasn't a problem in those days because nobody knew it existed. The problem was the Pope believed the world was flat. And so he neglected to draw the line on the other side of the world. And it, because the, this line should go all the way around the earth, but it only went halfway. So now the Portuguese were sailing east to the Spice Islands, which are right on the line. The Spanish eventually would be sailing west around the world and ending up also on this line. And they would meet big time. And this, this is one of the major problems in the history of California. Um, this is the first of the three major turning points in the history of California, was this division of the world the way it was. The next player on the stage is Vasco da Gama. Now, once the Portuguese realized the Spanish were in the Indies, uh, the Portuguese immediately set out a fleet. You can see the date here is only five years after Columbus and only three years after the Treaty of Tordesillas. Uh, so this, the Portuguese right got on their act and sent Magellan down to go around Africa and get to the Spice Islands. The race was on. Magellan. I'm sorry, Vasco da Gama sailed down to the Azores, which is right near the uh, Canary Islands. That's a Portuguese possession. Crossed the equator sideways with the wind, no problem. Picked up the uh, South Atlantic gyre, which Bernal Diaz had discovered. Followed it down to almost Rio de Janeiro and then followed the gyre around, came around the Cape of Good Hope. Picked up the Indian Ocean gyre followed it around and got to the Spice Islands. So the Portuguese arrived in the Spice Islands first. And part of this amazing 30 years, during the next 20 years, the, 
the Portuguese were sending armadas of as many as 30 ships into the Indian Ocean. The Spanish were send, sending armadas of as much as 30 ships to the Caribbean. Um, the Portuguese defeated the Arabs, defeated the Indians, defeated the Indonesian uh, uh, potentates, and took over possession of the Indian Ocean. So within 30 years, they had total control of the Indian Ocean and the Spice Islands before the Spanish got there. The question that's more interesting from us is, how did they get back? Well, they, they started from the Spice Islands. They picked up the Indian Ocean gyre and sailed around. They sailed down the coast of Africa. With difficulty, got around the Cape of Good Hope in Africa, picked up the South Atlantic gyre, followed it up the coast across the ocean. They should have had to follow all the way around here, but there was a shortcut that everybody knew about. And so there was a little shortcut. If you knew the wind and the weather, you could get up straight up and back into Portugal. And that's exactly what um, Vasco da Gama did. And he arrived back in Portugal. And so now the Portuguese were in the Spice Islands and the Spanish had realized, wait a minute, we're not in the Spice Islands. This is not, this is not Asia. What's going on? All right. Nunez de Balboa, and you've all heard of the word Balboa. This is somebody you have heard about. I want you to notice the date here, 1513. This is just a few years after uh, Vasco da Gama sailed around into the Indies. And Balboa did two things, he did a lot. He's a very interesting person. He'd make a great talk. He did two things. First of all, he founded a city called Santa Maria de la Antigua del Darien. This is the very first settlement on the mainland of the Western Hemisphere. The second thing he did was send an expedition out with, to steal the gold from the Indians and arrived at this, what he called the South Sea. And he realized right away, this was the ocean that would take the Spanish to the Spice Islands. And, and they thought it was really close. They didn't realize how big the Pacific Ocean was. So the race was on. Uh, Balboa was 1513. Within six years, the Spanish crown had organized a fleet to sail to the Spice Islands around the tip of South America under Ferdinand Magellan. You've all heard of him, I'm sure. He started out with five ships and 260 men. His plan was very simple. He was going to go from Spain. He was going to pick up the North Atlantic gyre, go across the equator, sail down the coast of South America, around the tip of Cape Horn, pick up the South Pacific gyre and sail right straight over to the things. He did, of course, he didn't know about these gyres, but he, he assumed that they were there at that point. So this is a little bit better picture of it. He would sail down with this thing to the Canary Islands, cross over here, um, come down to Portugal, I mean, I'm sorry, Brazil, and by the way, the Portuguese knew about this, and he was sailing in Portuguese territory, so they sent out a battle squadron to intercept him and sink him, but he managed to elude it. He sailed down the coast, but then he hit this little area right in here. You can see the winds are now against the direction of the ships, so it took him almost a year to get around the Cape Horn. Cape Horn has a, got a tremendous repu bad reputation. He lost one ship in a wreck, one ship mutinied went back to Spain, but three ships made it around. He picked up the, the South Pacific gyre, sailed up around here and over. Now he thought it was gonna be a three week trip. It turned out to be 98 days. This is probably the, the greatest feat in sailing ever. Most of his crew was starving to death. Uh, they were boiling belts and shoes to get protein. Rats were a delicacy. But they made it. Three ships did, did make it to the Philippines. Luckily, uh, Magellan took a photograph of his ships as they were going around Cape Horn, and we've got it for posterity here. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> um, so Magellan arrived in the Philippines. It didn't go well for Magellan. First thing he did was he decided he was going to attack the island of Mactan. So he took 25 men and attacked an island. Not good, not a good plan. The natives were not friendly. They were, by the way, they were, they were uh, sponsored by the Arabs. They had, they had modern weapons and Magellan was killed. 
The rest of his crew got away in the rowboats and, uh, and, and escaped. Um, so everything you learned in grade school is wrong. Magellan did not go around the world. He was not the first man to go around the world. He only made it halfway. There's an interesting side story to all of this, which I'm not going to go into. But now Magellan is dead, but the Spanish crews are still there with the three ships. So they get invited by another potentate in the Philippines to a, to a, a large banquet, which was a trap. And one third of the crews were massacred. They, the other two escaped. They had to burn one of the ships, and so now they have two ships. And this is where the California part comes, starts coming into the picture. So they have two ships. They go to the Spice Islands, elude the Portuguese fleets, which are looking for them, load their ships up with valuable cargo of cloves and spices, and they, they want to go back to Spain. So the Gomez, the captain of the Trinidad, says, listen, the, the smartest thing to do is I will sail my ship east back to Spain and the other captain we'll get to in a minute will sail west. So at least one of the ships will get through. So Gomez's plan was to take the Trinidad and this is, you can see how difficult now it's gonna be to get to California and back. Yep, he, his plan was to take the gyre all the way around the Pacific Ocean down the coast of California now this is 1520, okay? This is, this is over 150 years before San, San Diego was, was founded. Go across the equator, pick up the South Pacific gyre, follow it all the way down near Australia, cross the ocean around Cape Horn, across the Atlantic Ocean, pick up the South Atlantic gyre, sail up the coast of Africa, across, and then take the shortcut to Spain. This was his plan. What happened was that he sailed, didn't sail like Columbus did. He said, tried to sail a little bit too south, sailed into the hole. The crew got back starving into the Philippines and were captured by the Portuguese and, and spent and died in the died in Portuguese prisons. They were, uh, so the first expedition was gone. The second player is the important one, Juan Sebastian del Cano. He was the captain of the Victoria, and his plan was to sail west. Now, this is through Portuguese territory, and the Portuguese knew they were there. There was three battle squadrons looking for them. Every port in the Indian Ocean was alerted to capture and kill him if they saw him. So what he did was he kept way offshore, he followed the gyre around the Indian Ocean, way offshore of Africa, just like now with the pirates, the Somalian pirates, if you're a sailor, you say way offshore there. You don't want to get anywhere near the land. Sailed around the Cape of Horn, I mean Cape of Good Hope, picked up the South Atlantic gyre, sailed up the coast. By now they're starving and they finally have to land on a Portuguese island and try to get some food. And a lot of the men were killed. Came up and arrived in Spain. And this means that Juan Sebastián del Cano was the first person to circumnavigate the world, not Magellan. He's a Spanish, Spanish tall ship is named after him. Um, yeah, just one thing that I gotta get something here, that'll be okay. Um, he arrived in September 16th, 1522. The trip took three years. So if the Spanish were gonna going to colonize California at this point, it would be a three year round trip. And you'd have to run the Portuguese blockade, which was extremely dangerous. So you can see why at this point, California was not settled. Um, a couple of other interesting things. Um, he not only was the first person to sail around the world, which proved that the earth was round. At this point now, nobody could doubt that the earth was round. But another thing is when he arrived, he arrived on September 16th, but his logbook said September 15th. So he's missing a day. And they said, you screwed up. You, you didn't keep track of things. So I did every single day I wrote down in, in this logbook. Well, you're missing a day. And all of a sudden the light bulb went on. What he'd done is in sailing around the world once, he'd erased one of the rotations because we define a day as being one rotation of the earth. And he had subtracted one rotation. So this proved not only that the world was round, but the world was rotating. This was really bad news because everybody had thought the world was flat. Now it was 
faced with the idea that, hey, maybe the Earth is not the center of the universe. So this was the second thing he did. He arrived with one ship and 18 men out of five ships and 260 men. Was the trip worth it? You bet. That The spices in that voyage paid 10 times over the price of the expedition. So the Spanish immediately sent four more expeditions to the Spice Islands, and they were all captured by the Portuguese. So, so far, none of the expeditions have made it back except this one ship, uh, the Victoria. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the other ones. Um, we get Cabrillo, Juan Cabrillo. And Cabrillo was part of the, the fifth expedition to, to the, uh, to the, I'm going to call it the Philippines, to the, to the Spice Islands. Um, but it was a fairly large armada under Rui Lopez, but Cabrillo's job was to sail north and possibly find another way to get to the Spice Islands. Uh, 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 and so his job was to explore the north coast. He has got a long, very interesting history as well. So Cabrillo sailed from Acapulco with a large armada. Somewhere around Azuca here, they the Rui Lopez's expedition took off, got to the Philippines very easily, and was captured by the Portuguese. Cabrillo sailed up the coast. Now, it shows a straight line, but what he had to do was he was tacking back and forth against the wind. It took him three months to get from Acapulco to San Diego. It took 10 days to get from San Diego to Los Angeles. I worked that out. That's an average speed of one third of a mile per hour. <laughs> So it was very obvious that sailing up this coast was not going to be easy. Um, he made it all the way up to the Russian River, and they turned around and they came back and they wintered in either San Miguel Island, which is off of, of Santa Barbara, or Catalina, we're not sure which one. In an Indian attack, he broke his leg and he died of gangrene. So he died, he did not make it back. He, he's buried on one of those two islands, and, They've been looking for him for 450 years to find his grave. Um, when he arrived back, when the when rest of the crew arrived back, half of them were either dead or sick, and the whole expedition was considered a terrible, terrible failure. Um, and basically, they had written it off. There was two side lights to it. First of all, he and Uyoa, another, another explorer, explored Baja. Now, in the Middle Ages, there was a legend that said that there was an island, again, an Arab island in the Spice Islands, that was run by women called Amazons. And the, a chieftain in, in, in Arabia is called a caliph. You might have heard of the caliphates of uh, the ISIS. And a woman a ruler of, of a, a, an Arab country would be a caliph with an A on the end. So this was called the Island of the Califas, which in Spanish is, is translated as California. And so when they hit Baja, they figured that we found the Island of the Califas. So they called it California, and, and the name stuck. Turned out later, they proved that it was a peninsula and not an island, et cetera. But that's how we got our name California from. The other interesting thing, um, let me check one thing down here. Yeah, the next player is Andres de Ordineta. You see two dates. Well, he did one other thing that uh, is very, very interesting. After he retired, he became a historian and he took the log books of Cabrillo and Ulloa and a lot of the other people, Saavedra, and wrote stories about them and, and recorded them. The log books were lost. So for several hundred years, Cabrillo was forgotten. Nobody had ever heard of him. And it wasn't until they got that the, um, the stories of Ordineta and checked them out, that they actually realized that there was a guy named Cabrillo and he did go to California. Uh, what we do know is that there are other explorers and we'll never know who they are probably because the logbooks have never been found. So Urdineta, the first thing Ordineta did was give us the name Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo, otherwise he would have been forgotten by history. But he's got a couple of other interesting ports which are much more interesting in the history of California. He was on the second expedition, the Loiza expedition, after Magellan. Loiza died on the, on the long trip, and the expedition arrived in the Philippines. They filled up with spices, became very, very wealthy, sailed back into the hole, 
arrived back starving, sailed into the hole again, arrived back in the Philippines starving and were captured by the Portuguese. So Urdaneta was now in a prison in Portugal, and, and sorry, a Portuguese prison in the Spice Islands. But he was a clever fellow and he said, listen, we're gonna be slaves anyway. Why don't you let me do trade? I'm good at that. So he set up a trading post and started to make a lot of money and the Portuguese got really uh, upset at this and they finally sentenced him to death. And he said, aha, I'm a Spanish citizen. You can't sentence me to death. Only the King of Portugal can sentence me to death. He said, okay, they put him in chains, took him back in an armada to Lisbon, Lisbon one of the armadas back to Portugal. He got to Lisbon and he escaped and he got to Madrid. And when he arrived in Madrid, he became officially the second man to circumnavigate the globe, not Sir Francis Drake. So the first person to circumnavigate the globe was Juan Sebastián del Cano and the second one was Andrés de Urdaneta. Um, since he'd already been there, the sixth expedition asked Urdaneta if they would go. And he said, are you crazy? The first five have all been captured by the Portuguese. They said, we're not messing around this time. It's going under Legazbi. We're taking a, an army with us. We're taking all ships. We're taking cannons. We're going to fight. So he came on the trip. They arrived in the Philippines. Um, Legazbi set up a fort. They, they set up a garrison, ship patrols got a lot of spices, huge riches. And Legazpi said to Urdaneta, um, now I want you to take this stuff back. And he said, no problem, I'll take them through the Indian Ocean. And he said, Legazpi said, no, we're, pro we're prohibited by the king to go that direction. You must go back the way we came. And Urdaneta said, are you nuts? Nobody's ever done that and arrived alive. So they ordered him to do it. So he had sailed, now they had sailed from Mexico and they came across here. This was the easy trip, but to come back, Urdaneta, instead of trying to sail straight back, did what Columbus did. He sailed in the opposite direction, Northwest, picked up the gyre, came around down the coast of California. Now this is 200 years before San Diego was, was settled, 200 years. And he arrived in Veracruz, so the crew was not starving, didn't lose any men. This was an easy trip. And this set up what we call La Volta. Um, this was a round trip in Spanish, La Volta. Question? Um, this means the roundabout in Spanish. So for 250 years, Spanish galleons were sailing from the Philippines to Acapulco and back around here, 250 years but San Diego was never settled. So what's going on here? This doesn't make any sense. You'd think that if all these ships were sailing down the coast, they would have stopped and they would have found out what a great place it was and maybe settled Palos Verdes. Enter the second most important thing in the history of California. Um, La Casa de Contratación. This was the Board of Trade in Seville. They controlled all of the trade in the Spain. So their job was to supply the New World and pick up uh, the goods of the New World. That was the theory. And the practice was they, were to, they wanted to make as much profit as possible. So just like the British were taking advantage of the Americans and the trade restrictions were what caused part of the American Revolution, the restrictions against the Casa de Contratación caused South America to revolt. And what they did to restrict this trade was they, they limited the trade from one ship leaving Acapulco and no more. So every year, one galleon would leave Acapulco and go to the Philippines. And that same year, a galleon would sail back to Acapulco. And so what that meant was that if you sailed from Acapulco, you would cross this ocean, very simple trip, fill your ship up. You'd have to wait a year before you could come back. So now the whole trip took two years to finish. And these ships were so valuable and they were targets for English pirates, as we'll see in a little bit, that they were prohibited from coming anywhere near the land. So even though it was an easy trip, they stayed way offshore of California. So for the next 200 years, these ships went by and never stopped anywhere in California. 
including our San Diego, which was the first one. And another 50 years before the Mexican Revolution, before this La Volta was cut off. So this is the second reason that California was not settled by the Spanish, is because the Casa de Contratación controlled the trade, prohibited Spanish ships from sailing in the Pacific Ocean, except for one every year. So this was a big deal in the history of California. Our next player, oh, by the way, yeah, Andres de Ordinata is famous for setting up that, that Volta. The next player is Sebastian Vizcaino, and he was the second Spaniard to sail on the coast of California. You notice there's three dates here. Um, the first date is 1586. So he was a, a man who was very enterprising. He sailed on a Manila galleon on La Volta, got to the Philippines, made a lot of money in trade, actually became quite rich, and sailed back uh, on the second part to cash in his money. And unfortunately, he sailed on a ship called Nuestra Señora de la Santa Ana. And he, he followed the Volta the same way everybody else did, but he didn't make it all the way because he ran into a man came Sir John Hawkins. Now the English call him Sir John Hawkins. The Spanish call him Hawkins la Pirata, Hawkins the Pirate. And he held up the ship. Now this is kind of crazy because the English ship was really small and the, the Manila Galleon was the biggest, baddest ship in the world in those days, very heavily armed. So how can a small English pirate ship basically hold up its that it's like maybe in a rowboat holding up the USS Iowa. Well, the Spanish ship had lots of cannons, but there was one minor detail. They didn't have any cannonballs. Why didn't they have any cannonballs? Because it was all contraband, okay? Now the English and most of the pirates in those days were actually gentlemanly. There was no walking the plank. The unwritten rule was if you didn't put up a fight, they took all your money and they let you go. That's exactly what Hawkins did. He just took all the money, let the ship go, and so Vizcaino arrived in Acapulco penniless. So that's the first thing in his life. But he got a job working in the Spanish uh, trade. And his first voyage was up into Baja, California, where there was a pearl, a large pearl industry in here. And the Spanish were up in this Baja for a lot. They had, there's 23 missions in Baja, California. I'm not sure if you were aware of that. Um, so they were colonizing Baja pretty well, very slowly, but, but pretty well. So they sent Vizcaino up the coast to see if he could find a safe harbor for Manila galleons where they could stop and, and maybe even set up a garrison to stop the English pirates. So he started out and he had the same problem, it took him months and months and months to get up to uh, Monterey. He got up a little bit further than Monterey. Uh, he did go to San Diego. He named, renamed all the places. So the name San Diego, Los Angeles, Catalina are all named by Vizcaino even though he was told not to rename them. Uh, he really didn't do much, just like uh, Cabrillo. He, he didn't discover anything new. He, the only thing he really found out was that it was just too difficult to sail up this coast to be practical, to, to produce anything that was of any value up in California because it was just uh, too difficult to do it. Um, he arrived back with his crew starving, uh, but he didn't want to be named a failure, so he exaggerated everything. For example, he said Monterey was a wonderful port and there was a huge Indian village of rich people. So when De Portola got there, he couldn't find it because it was the Monterey is not a, a good port and uh, there were no big Indian villages and stuff. Uh, so he sort of exaggerated stuff. But Vizcaino was the second one. He also, it was 60 years after Cabrillo. So for 60 years, nobody that we know of was sailing up and down this coast. For 60 whole years, nothing happened on this coast. Again, you can see the difficulties in getting there. Um, the third date in Vizcaino, and the third most important thing in the history of California, uh, was over in the Indian Ocean. And you never hear this, but the Portuguese were beginning to lose control to the Dutch. Now the Dutch were fighting England and they were certainly the equals. There's many, many, many battles, naval battles between the Dutch and the English over in the uh, North Sea. 
the Dutch came into the Indian Ocean and slowly defeated the Portuguese. And by uh, 1600 or so, they, they had pretty much taken over the entire uh, uh, um, Indian Ocean. Uh, the Portuguese were out and all of the islands in the, in the Spice Islands were, were owned by the Dutch until World War II when the Japanese defeated them and kicked them out. And after World War II, then they were made independent. They were not given back to the Dutch. So the Dutch were in control of the Indian Ocean as I'm speaking right now. And the next target was the Spanish. So the Dutch, I'm gonna see if I got a thing on this. Uh, I don't, I gotta go back up here. Um, the first thing that happened was the Dutch went to La Volta. I'm gonna see, go back here. To, uh, so the first phase in the war was, was very smart. The Dutch sent a, an expedition, which the Spanish claim were just pirates. And they went over here and they captured Acapulco and most of the ports in Mexico. So the Dutch now were in control of the ports in Mexico. And so now the Spanish had nowhere to send an expedition from and nowhere to send the Minigallians to. So they had basically shut off the Spanish control of the Pacific Ocean. So at this point, the Dutch were in control of the entire Pacific Ocean. This was, this was a major turning point in the history of not only California, but maybe even the Western part of the United States. Um, the Spanish government called on Vizcaino again, and Vizcaino set up a fleet, cut off the supply line again, the Volta, from the Dutch. And the Dutch ran out of supplies, and so they had to leave, and so they retreated back around the Pacific Ocean to the uh, Indian Ocean, but they were not ready to leave. They built up a major force and attacked the Philippines. And it was a very large series of battles, which are known as the um, oh, that's the Santa Ana being attacked. I'm sorry, I got the wrong battle. There we go. Um, and after about three year running battle, very, very similar to the Japanese and the Americans in World War II, it took over thousands of miles in many, many different places. But the final culminating battle was in Manila Bay. And in Spanish, the name is La Naval de Manila. And you can see the date, 1646, 150 years before San Diego was settled, just to put this in perspective. Uh, the Spanish should have lost this battle, but they won and the Dutch were defeated. And they finally made a treaty and Spain got the Philippines and the China trade and the Dutch got all the rest. And the Spanish were quite happy with that. If the Dutch had won that battle, they would have controlled everything in the Pacific Ocean and absolutely certainly would have settled the uh, west coast of North America and the west coast of Mexico. Um, there was no reason to prohibit them because they were not sailing back to Spain. Um, so they would have set up colonies all up and down the Pacific coast of the United States. 150 years before San Diego. And this would have been a Dutch state when the Americans arrived in the gold rush and, and probably would never have been a part of the United States. It's a great thing to think about what if, but anyway, this was a great turning point in the history of California. Uh, we all know the Spanish won the battle. The Spanish maintained control for the next 150 years, but didn't do anything with California. And eventually, De Portola came again, 1769, set up a series of missions along the coast with Junipero Serra. The reason that, that De Portola was sent up there was because the Russians were coming down from the north and they had fur traders. And there is a Fort Ross, which is a Russian fort north of San, San Francisco. And so the uh, Spanish realized that they needed to set up a presence in California, otherwise they would, they would lose it. And so the De Portola expedition set up the first mission in uh, uh, San Diego. The second one was up in Carmel in Monterey. And then they set up a string of missions down in, in between so that they would have some uh, position there in California in order to maintain their claim. And at this point, I leave the scene to Stephanie Brito and uh, Elena Johnson take over because this is their bailiwick from here on in. So, the end. <laughs>
for you. So if there's any questions, uh, I'd be glad to answer them. So interesting, Bob. I have to watch this again. I have a question, Bob. Yeah, okay. Uh, didn't uh, Vizcaino land here on the uh, peninsula or at the mouth of the LA River? Yes, and, he did. Yes, he did. It, he's the yes. first one to land, right? Cabrillo was, did not land, as I understand that, it. You are correct. You are absolutely correct. He was the first Spaniard to land in uh, San Diego and Los Angeles. Yeah. And Vizcaino is uh, walking up the canyon from what is now San Pedro, uh, past the uh, 76 refinery up to Machado Lake. And, <laughs> and he's and he's looking at the at the beautiful springtime. It must have been springtime because there was a lot of green plants around. So he yep. called the place Palos Verdes. Yep. <laughs> Unfortunately, he was eaten by Reggie the alligator in Lake Machado. <laughs> 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 I always wondered about his fate. <laughs> they actually died an old man in Mexico City. He lived in his 80s. Well, wow. they also, interesting, the other side light was the next, his next trip was to Japan. Wow. And he was there to set, make friends with the Japanese. He was really there, sent, sent by the Spanish to spy on them and make charts because the Japanese were not allowing trade at that point. So he brought back a bunch of, uh, of, of uh, Japanese guys and they set up the first uh, Asian em embassy in Europe, in Madrid. A, it was actually a Japanese embassy in Madrid. And they finally, he, he brought them back to Japan and they were all beheaded because they'd become Christians. Oh. <laughs> There's a lot of a lot of really fun stuff. I've just kind of touched the base here, but there's a ton of really fun stuff. This was an amazing period of history.